the text and uh, some of the reasoning behind this. Uh, the title Overcoming Servitude for, 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 for me is uh, very appropriate. Um, uh, Peter Bratzis and Bruno, who's here with us, are, and myself are working on a text uh, uh, called Techniques of Servitude. We want to try to understand you know, how we've gotten to a place that so many people are really uh, almost desirous of their their servitude rather than their freedom and this mm -hmm. inability of people really to take risks at this point. So that's one reason for the title. And um, to me, I read Anti Oedipus uh, within the tradition of philosophy, if you will. And I mean, it's, a, it's an anti-philosophical, philosophical work, but I read it as really a prolema gamma to an ethical philosophy. This is a very ethical text to me. Uh, in the sense that they raise a perpetual ethical question. Why do people desire their slavery rather than their freedom? What is this desire really about? And they pose this question, at least to my mind, uh, in, in almost the most radical fashion of all, you know, through what they consider desiring production and desiring machines. And um, uh, so that, that's sort of the reasoning behind bringing this text around. Uh, I understand the, the, uh, the focus on a thousand plateaus. It's a more fun text in a lot of ways. I think it's resonated with a lot of people in different ways, uh, especially the cartography, uh, you know, the notions of space, the, the beautiful sections on geology of morals, the birth of linguistics, all of these things are very important. And uh, I mean, I have the book here, you know, I, I've read it, uh, The Thousand Plateaus as well. Uh, we just don't have time to go all over it, but I, I'll certainly make references to it. This was written and uh, conceptualized, uh, uh, well, actually published eight years later than the anti -Oedipus. The Anti-Oedipus was uh, published in 1972 in France and translated rather quickly into the United States, into English by Mark Seam and uh, Bob Hurley in 1977 and had a kind of underground existence for a while, a while on, the, on the left, especially in the United States, you know, and not really that well received by the Freudo Marxists or by the Marcusians and the Frankfurt School uh, people as well. This was considered pretty, you know, um, off the wall kind of craziness uh, in terms of its reception in the United States. So never really built except in certain circles, the, you know, the, the Columbia University, L'Otranger, Simeotech, that kind of grouping and, you know, a few other people that really took it up. Brian Masumi, of course, in Montreal, um, oh, yeah. who wrote uh, the uh, user's manual, which is a very good book. Uh, uh, Capitalism and Schizophrenia, the title, A User's Manual by Brian Masumi, is one of the best introductions and, you know, ponies to this book. Uh, so I recommend it. A very, very solid work. Uh, uh, M-A-S-S-U-M-I, uh, Brian Masumi, who I think is now, uh, I'm not sure if he's retired from University of Montreal, but has been there many, many years and has done his own, own, own work too, but was certainly very influenced by Deleuze and others. So anyway, uh, go, going back to the text um, um, itself, this was a, a, you know, not really a collaboration. Uh, it was more <laughs> a, 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 an event where Gilles Deleuze would drive <laughs> to the north of Paris, to the Clinic Laborde, to meet with Guattari and they would free associate on the grounds of a very advanced, uh, you know, uh, what we call a uh, psychiatric institution, you know, whatever you want to call it, asylum, you know, I, I don't know what it's called today in the, in the vernacular we used to call, you know, the, the good old funny farm. But this was a very advanced place, Laborde Clinic, outside of Paris, uh, known for experimentation with open psychiatry where hierarchies between uh, doctors and patients were broken down. Um, um, you know, there was a more open space for engagement between, again, the inmates and the, and the, uh, the, uh, the psychiatric staff, as well as the doctors. And this is sort of anticipatory and also um, parallel to the developments at Tavistock Clinic with R.D. Lang, you know, the great uh, experiments at Tavistock Clinic, which uh, most of you that know something about the history of psychoanalysis, Anna Freud was at uh, Tavistock Clinic in, in London. And uh, 
off the uh, Russell uh, Russell uh, tube in in, in London. Um, so um, a very um, very interesting connection between the Langian forces, R. D. Lang, who in a way came much more out of um, the existential psychoanalytic tradition, more out of a Sartrean perspective than out of a strict psychoanalytic Freudian moment, and this connection to Deleuze and Guattari. So for my, my purposes, I, I want to point out several, uh, you know, anchors, if you will, theoretical anchors, first of all. Um, to, to my mind, uh, uh, what, what formed in France in the 1960s was a theoretical matrix, a very important theoretical matrix that we're all still sort of recovering from and also still use actively in different works. Uh, 1965, the Reading Capital Group with Louis Althusser, uh, Etienne Balibar, Pierre Macharet, Roger Establet, and uh, Jacques Rancière, the, 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 the five, and Alain Badiou being kind of peripheral to that. Um, so this was a, a very significant event that opened up very many spaces for new forms of reading, known mainly, mainly as the symptomatic reading, you know, which was influenced by Lacan. Althusser certainly had a, a lot of this. He used the concept of overdetermination and contradiction, which is the most significant essay in terms of his reading strategy outside of the actual text reading capital, which is now available, I think all the pieces are available now in English. They always were in French. So th this was an event in France and something that was really taken up. Those of you that know Jean-Luc Godard films, there's uh, one where people are doing jumping jacks, students are doing jumping jacks on the theoretical base. And that's a kind of homage to Louis Althusser in terms of the theoretical base and the exercise of uh, you know, doing uh, jumping jacks uh, uh, before May of 68. So that, that's one moment. The other one to me is, uh, of course, Michel Foucault's The Order of Things or Words and Things in French, a better translation, you know, which was actually a, an event in, quote, structuralist thought. And this is, of course, post-Sartre, post-Levi-Strauss, you know, uh, moment, the existentialism and structuralist moment in France. Um, Simultaneously, of course, Lacan seminars are going on, 1964 marking the uh, fundamental, um, four fundamental concepts of psychoanalysis, a uh, very crucial uh, uh, text of Lacan, sort of a, a new, if you will, transition to his later work and actually a, a regrounding of a lot of his, uh, you know, uh, 11 seminars before that. Um, so Foucault's order in things, which was kind of a structuralist uh, testimony, uh, uh, is another part of the theoretical matrix of this period. And then, of course, Derrida's De la Grammatologie, of Grammatology, which hit the United States like a, you know, a, a major firestorm um, in, um, in the... Uh, uh, in 19, in the late 1960s, but really in the 70s, which was the beginning of French deconstruction and its dominance in the, uh, in the American Academy. So these are the three pillars, if you will, even though all these authors had other works before them. But I mean, I'm thinking of reading capital, order of things, and of course, uh, of grammatology. You know, the question of language, the question of how we read, you know, and, uh, and then uh, uh, thirdly, you know, what kind of structures and representations are we subjected to in terms of, uh, you know, our relationship to the world of, of things and really in a sense, uh, a kind of an attempt to look at object relations, even though he doesn't mention that uh, 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 Foucault, he does, uh, you know, talk about relationships and representation and resemblances among things throughout that work. And it's a very significant work, one, one forgotten. Of course, Foucault is also writing the history of madness and has a completely, uh, you know, an obsession, if you will, in his early career with madness and civilization, the history of madness, as well as his early books on, um, on uh, mental illness and psychology. So there's this interest going on. Althusser, as probably most of you know, suffered from a very deep depression you know, to the point of mania. I don't know what the diagnosis, I'm sure it shifted many times, but he was someone who was consistently institutionalized and despite his radicality, went uh, formally to, um, to, um, uh, to um, 
dominant psychoanalysts at that time, people that were, you know, uh, part of the power structure of French psychiatry. So, you know, he had that, that too. Uh, Denny Da was married to a psychoanalyst or, you know, uh, when he was alive and she just recently passed away and, uh, you know, uh, ongoing uh, relationship to this as well. So anyway, outside this theoretical matrix, I want to situate the anti-Oedipus in a way, because for me, it was against all of these theoretical matrices. It was an attempt to get back to the intuitive, the practical intuitive, <laughs> away from just the theoretical, away from the dominant French thinking. That was an attempt, as Foucault mentions in the introduction, the escape from Freud and Marx, or at least the orthodoxy in both cases, right? In a way, this, this was one of the intentions of doing this uh, and also to get away from orthodox psychoanalysis and the way it had been used in the French scene. Uh, apropos Lacan too, who, who actually broke with this as early as the 1950s with her famous discourse on Rome, but, um, but I think they're doing something differently here. And again, it was a collaborative effort uh, that's going on. So uh, again, they meet and they free associate. And then at the end of the day, they put up their notes. And then finally, after I think about two and a half, three years, this is published into the book called The Anti-Oedipus, Capitalism and Schizophrenia. And the anti, first a remark about that, anti, A-N-T-I in Greek, uh, it's a very rich word. It not only means in opposition to something or against something, it also means generative of. So in a certain way, we're, we're, we're in this position always in this book of a for and against Freud, right? And a for and against Lacan. It's a very ambiguous tension that's going on. And hopefully I can point to some of those nuances because it's not just strictly a complete rupture. Uh, I want to I want to point that out in in terms of their analysis. So th this is very important to keep in mind. The anti always has a generative aspect of it. So you know, Antigone from the family <laughs> and from the generative, you know, in a sense, and also in opposition. Right? It's very interesting to what what goes on, and and also making good on the tradition too. So I don't think these are just uh, you know so they've been accused of being children or just being uh, you know uh, the the bad children of, of the psychoanalytic movement. <laughs> And they just were dissing everything. This is really not the case. This is a book of extremely dense learning. And, uh, uh, you know, and I think something that is, uh, you know, we can still use today. So an another thing about the overcoming of servitude, even though there's not a blueprint here, they're not interested so much just in critique and ex explanation. They're interested in how. They're interested in function and the how of something. And, and you can, you know, next week we'll go over the beginning where it said, what a mistake to call it the id, right? Why not just call it it? And this is a play on uh, uh, George Grodick, uh, you know, another a bad child of the psychoanalytic movement, who is uh, basically the person, uh, G-R-O-D-D-E-C-K, uh, Grodick, who was, uh, wrote the book of the it, um, in which, um, you know, is a critique of religion. And Freud is actually defending Grodick in the book, uh, The Future of an Illusion. Uh, it's a, actually, it is a def in defense of Grodick against the uh, uh, um, um, Swiss pastor, Oscar Fitzer, and those that are trying to merge psychoanalysis with religion. So anyway, the, the it itself uh, is how something is functioning. The unconscious is no longer. Uh, I want to point this out too. This is very important. Unlike Freud, unlike traditional psychoanalysis, it is not a theatrical representation. It is not theatrical uh, repu reputation, uh, representation. It is um, against that, against the theatrical representation. And we will see later in the semester or uh, in our reading how Antoine Artaud is used very effectively in this uh, in this. Uh, in this case, right? This, uh, this moment of against the theatrical, the unconscious is a factory. And for those of us that are quote unquote Marxists of one stripe or another, 
This is very interesting in a way. They are interested in the unconscious as a factory, as a productive machine, a desiring machine, hence the mechanistic mm -hmm. language as well. And most of you, I, I hope you have the edition. I, I have the older edition. Uh, I think it's the Minnesota um, edition. I think that uh, if there's a new edition, a Rutledge edition, but uh, it has the uh, the great uh, Richard Linder uh, um, um, figure of the boy with machine, right in the in the uh, in the beginning. And this is very interesting. This reading of the, of the thing that no longer is it daddy, mommy, me. I'm just going to go plug in somewhere else. And I want us to, you know, <laughs> keep this in mind as a background image as we go through this uh, text. So very, very important to keep this uh, keep this in mind. This was in 1954, and this has come from a, um, I think, a, a family uh, in New York. The Leffer family owned the uh, owned the text that Deleuze and Guattari, um, you know, uh, uh, used as as part of their um, uh, cover. Uh, in the uh, French edition. So um, anyway, again, the unconscious as a factory versus that of, you know, philosophical theatricum. You know, it is a factory. What a mistake to call it it is kind of the beginning. You know, let's call it it as a way. So there's a re rethinking, if you will, of, of, of the unconscious. I want to make a couple of remarks and I, I want to maybe hear uh, two again from you. I'm glad we introduced each other. I mean, one, one thing that's lost in all of this, in my uh, estimation, in rereading, is Guattari's presence. Guattari was analyzed by Jacques Lacan. He broke, uh, you know, not in a vicious way, but went off on other, other paths and, uh, um, you know, and uh, is someone that is not really read actively. Deleuze is uh, always thought of, this is the book of Deleuze. But it's mm. really, again, uh, um, not a collaborative, not really even a dialogue. I think they best put it, and I, I wrote down, uh, I, I, I had a quote from Deleuze that they were like two streams, you know, there were rivers that were running into each other and kind of like double streams of consciousness, if you will. And they, they ended up forming the third river. So this was not really collaboration or you take this part and someone else take this other part. It was really a, it was really a, a kind of moment of uh, streams uh, that, were, that were meeting each other into a third or kind of a tributary uh, uh, relationship that, that happened. Uh, uh, I'll read you what Deleuze said. We didn't collaborate like two persons do. We were rather like two streams that would meet to make a third that would have been us. <laughs> so again, they, they, this is their, their method, if you will, more than free association, more of like streams of, of consciousness uh, happen, happening, right? And uh, again, the itinerary, and this is maybe why it's difficult to read because we like to stop sometimes and reflect, the text is really like a movement, right? It's a movement always. It's not something that where you just stop, reflect, paragraph to paragraph. It is a movement. And I'm going to speak uh, as, we, as, as, as we go on of the three different synthetic moments, right? There's a very interesting thing of the connective, the disjunctive, right? And the conjunctive syntheses that is borrowed from Kant, but very different than the Kantian uh, synthesis. It is not the subject of representation that is constituting the synthesis. It's actually from the outside back in. So we're, we'll have to speak to this too. You know, it's the subject proce processing and constituting from the outside. Yeah, in, in, in many ways. So we'll, we'll, we'll speak to this too. All right. Um, the, the, um, the, the, the relevance of Guattari, very militant in this, um, in this engagement with um, um, you know, patients at Laborde Clinic. He has a lot of practical experience. Deleuze is actually a psychoanalyst too, as well as being a professor of philosophy. I don't know, you know he certainly was very close to Winnicott, uh, going back to what Lydia mentioned in ob object relations theory. He had a lot, a lot of respect for Winnicott, as did Lacan. So it's not like the English school was completely disgraced here, or, or you know, left aside, or, or um, uh, for that matter, as I mentioned earlier, R. D. Lang, very important. But anyway, I want to take a step back for a second. French psychoanalysis, 
uh, was really dominated by Marie Bonaparte. And French communism, Marxist thinking, was dominated by the Communist Party, right, mm -hmm. by the PCF. So you have these two orthodoxies in some ways, Marie Bonaparte being, uh, you know, most of you probably know this, she sold jewels to buy Freud passage into France in uh, the late 1930s to get him through. And the famous quote of when he was asked when he crossed the border, what did you think of the uh, Gestapo? He replied, I highly recommend them. <laughs> so, so uh, you know, he always had the joke still with him. Uh, so um, anyway, but Marie Bonaparte really uh, was in, in charge, if you will, uh, her group of people of French psychoanalysis. And according to Lacan and to Sartre, this is very interesting in a way that this was an incompetent uh, you know, um, um, kind of psychoanalysis that would became dominant. So one reading you can do, since some of you are philosophers here, is to read Being and Nothingness of Sartre, the 1943 Phenomenological Ontology, as an attack on French psychoanalysis. That's one thing. And why he forms at the end of the book something called existential psychoanalysis, a new way of looking at things. He could not stand the deterministic nature of what he saw was going on in the French, French school. So Sartre becomes sort of like a, a, a obviously a, um, um, a, a trailblazer for this movement. Of course, R.D. Lang and David Cooper take up a lot of Sartre's work in the existential psychoanalysis. The Divided Self is a very Sartrean book as is self and others, uh, uh, you know, uh, no way around that. But I, I think also he paved the way for this kind of experimentation that went on too. Of course, Lacan at the same time is, is you know, not into the deterministic school. And of course is privileging the notion of the unconscious is structured like a language. Right is one of the battle cries, which is a play, if you will, on Heidegger's. You know, the language is the house of being. You know, uh, and you know, I mean, I, I won't go back so far, but Heidegger is obviously very important here as well. The design analytic movement, and these are things we forget as we think about today. We're dominated, and Jane can correct me if I'm wrong, or anybody that's practicing. Uh, therapy today, but it seems like th therapy today is dominated by cognitive uh, uh, psychology, cognitive behavioral psychology, and now what's called dialectical behavioral th uh, therapy, as well as behaviorism. And that psychoanalysis, certainly in the traditional sense, has been relegated, as has, you know, psychoanalytic psychotherapy. So we're in a mess, you know, and it goes to show you where we are politically and where we are culturally, you know, how this has occurred, you know, since the last uh, 40 mm. years, if you will, there is no alternative, you know, mm. and remember, Thousand Plateaus marks the beginning. I, I like look, work, looking at dates in terms of a world <laughs> historical framework. 1980 is the advent of yeah. Rager Thatcherism and yeah. Milk Plateau is published that same year. Right. And, 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 you know, and we get uh, zero sum games in economics. Yeah. We begin to get, you know, the Laffler curve, all these kind of other other moments that are that are, uh, you know, we still are subjected to today. And, uh, uh, you know, we, we'll talk more about that. So anyway, I want to, again, background this with the existential psychoanalysis of SART. Uh, the best example of that, and I've mentioned this many times, and I'm always taken when I reread it, is his reading of uh, Genet, of Jean Genet. Uh, Saint Genet, uh, comedian and actor, uh, martyr and uh, an actor, uh, is the, 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 the French title. He, um, he engages the existential psychoanalytic approach, and he also does the same thing from a phenomenological perspective with Flaubert, which he considered to be his great work that has never been studied in the United States. A few allusions to it, but it's never been picked up by literary studies, uh, the Flaubert, Gustave Flaubert, the idiot of the family, it's called. Four volumes. You know, this was what Sartre considered to be his masterwork uh, at the end. So th this 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 played out a lot. At the same time, you know, as I said, the Lacanian school is going on, and and Guattari is part of this, and all these experiments are going uh, are happening. The Art Brut movement 
is part of what's happening in the Labord Clinic, as well as, you know, a lot of poetics and a kind of freeing, if you will, of the, uh, of the um, um, oppression of mental, mental health, um, you know, uh, um, or uh, according to mental patients, if you will, you know, again, looked at as, as human beings. Right. So you had a right wing Thomas Zaz, the myth of mental illness, but the left wing was looking at this as a result, if you will, of the capitalist system. Right. The schizoid. And I want to mention two other things here as a background. Certainly, if you have not read Steps to an Ecology of Mind of Gregory Bateson, this is a very important text on the double bind of which schizophrenia has much of a basis in, you know, the double messaging that the mother is sending and also that the society is sending, sending and the contradictory moments that all of us are subjected to in one way or another, but how this begins to set up a schizophrenic li linguistic uh, schema that can be analyzed and undone at many, at many levels. So this is a very important background uh, text to this as well. And something that, um, um, again, uh, Jean-Francois Lyotard in the postmodern condition um, engages uh, actively in, uh, in uh, uh, moving forward uh, to where, where we are. So um, an another aspect of this. So um, anyway, I want to I want to um, um, also speak to um, uh, the, the 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 mental mental health clinic uh, uh, in in France was also used as sites of resistance during the war. So there was always this tradition and uh, of the <laughs> the use of hospitals as places where the resistance could be taken up, you know, in a way. We are so far from this in America today, you know, anyway, I'm noticing in New York, the more I get around, more and more homeless. I walk today about uh, 10 blocks, you know, I'm, I'm seeing people living on the streets. It's reminiscent, it's not as bad as the uh, late 80s, early 90s before Giuliani time, but it's very, very interesting to see this at work today. Uh, once again, this, this kind of return of the non-caring, even though the government has put a moratorium on uh, eviction, right, et cetera. We're seeing this play out more and more. So again, to go back to uh, Deleuze and Guattari, this um, uh, notion of, uh, of uh, the hospital as a site of resistance is, is a very active thing in, in, French, in the French resistance uh, forward. So there was always this kind of, you know, um, if you will, um, practice that looked at the, 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 the quote, sick or the ones that are abnormal um, as uh, potential agents, right? And as, you know, full human beings, right? Which we never really had in the United States, you know, that we never really had. Unless you were well healed in the United States, it was very difficult to get decent therapy in, you know, 30, 40 years ago, and today probably really nowhere in some ways in terms of clinics. Very, very expensive clinics, you know, that have been privatized in the United States. There really is no public health, you know facilities for this. I mean, I, I know people that have gone in recently. I mean, it just sounds horrendous what goes on. Everything is dictated by insurance, how long you stay. It has nothing to do with Medicaid, et cetera, et cetera. So this book, in a way, is also an attempt to liberate us from normalizing tendencies in the profession. So in that way, it's also a very, very radical. Um, um, so, um, I want to uh, again. I want to say the book. The book itself has a tremendous. Uh, uh, um, Any Oedipus presupposes a lot of knowledge, and I'll try my best to, you know, point to that as we read it. One of the reasons for the explication of the, the text is that, um, you know, one has to be on kind of equal footing with Freudian psychoanalysis, Marxist political economy, some of the debates, and all of this. French theory, you know, theater itself. And I, I want to say this, the important, the most impressive thing to me in this book was the, their ability to listen to artists, to Beckett, to Kleist, 
to Antoine Artaud, to the poetics and the filmmakers, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, Bruno this morning mentioned that he had watched La Chinoise again. Of course, since he was watching it, I had to watch it this afternoon <laughs> to kind of bone up on it again. La Chinoise anticipates all the events of May of 68, Jean-Luc Godard's book, uh, work, right? Very, very interesting in that regard. We've learned more from that than we do in terms of the social history or whatever by listening to these people. The Beckett uh, you know, uh, uh, references throughout the book, uh, very uh, uh, amazing. So this is a book really uh, as well, not only for the quote academics, in fact, the academics kind of ruin it. It's a book for artists and cre highly creative people in my, my opinion. It's really going in that, that way. You know, in, in some ways, and a, a kind of different, if you will, thought machine, you know, something outside. Now, I mentioned in the description, I would like to read this too. And this is a very speculative gesture on my part that this is a prolemagama to a first philosophy of, quote, postmodernism or post structuralism. This is the beginning or an introduction, if you will, and that a thousand plateaus itself could be the fundamental ontology of the future, if you will. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm just, I'm speculating here, but I'm trying to think of this as that prolema gamma. Uh, uh, again, I wanna mention, and, and excuse me for, you know, making so many references, but I think it's important. Deleuze, you know, uh, writes in um, 1968, he publishes Difference and Repetition, which is a work of philosophy, um, to, he published Logique de Sens, another work of philosophy. And of course, this, this ongoing work with the Anti-Oedipus. And then a book that is very important, I think, to this as well, in terms of arrangements and uh, expression, Spinoza's Theory of Expression, uh, which is a very academic work, but very crucial to Deleuze's uh, 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 work, working. And we're gonna mention more and more of Spinoza for those of you philosophically uh, you know, inclined, uh, because this book is tremendously influenced by Spinoza's you know, ethics on the one hand, in terms of the question that I posed, uh, you know, why do we desire our freedom? Um, you know, I mean, no, well, I desire my freedom, but why do we desire our slavery rather than our freedom as an ethical question that goes forward, as well as the question of nature and culture. They're really trying to get beyond that dichotomy. This is throughout. This is really an attempt to look at, you know, for lack of a better term, homo natura or homo natura within the context of nature, nature, with naturum, natura, natura, natura. Yeah. So I want to keep that in mind as we read this. Another philosophical uh, reference, that, and this is mostly Deleuze, but Guattari is very aware of, of course, Nietzsche. You know, the two philosophers that are most prevalent are Nietzsche, the genealogy of morals, um, you know, which some of you have uh, studied, uh, I know, and uh, um, um, uh, certainly the first and second essays, the essay on bad conscience and resentiment. And, uh, you know, in, in a way, one of the underlying treatises here, uh, or, or, or if you will, one of the underlying uh, movements here is the uh, claim that psychoanalysis itself and Freud himself is part of a culture of resentiment. Very, it's a very interesting kind of working thing. Whereas it's not, and and you know, Freud himself said Nietzsche signified to me a nobility to which I can never attain in my youth. And then, of course, denied ever reading them, even though Nietzsche <laughs> is very prevalent throughout Freud's work. And uh, most of you know Lou Andreas Salome, Nietzsche's muse and, uh, you know, uh, soulmate, so to speak, and uh, object of Nietzsche's desire was, uh, was uh, uh, certainly, uh, you know, in Freud's camp. And he asked many times about the relationship to Nietzsche. So I, I want to keep that in mind, too, the Nietzschean category of resentiment and how our morality is born, and especially the attack against the aesthetic type. And there's a type uh, under attack here, which is the aesthetic uh, moral type of the revolution. You know, we have many people on the left that said capitalism is evil. 
I think this is a very misguided, you know, attempt to look at capitalism. It's a system. It's a system we live under. If we judge it through moral principles, we're missing what it really is, how it developed in some ways. You know, to use language like this is, is I think, very much limits our, our thinking, you know, in many ways. And, uh, you know, and, and to think of this more in terms of a system of power relations and how do we undo this power is another aspect that we can be engaging. So we have, we're going to have these two philosophical, you know, uh, major influence, Baruch, Benedictus, he gave up the Baruch later, Benedictus uh, um, um, Spinoza, and of course, Frederick Wilhelm Nietzsche, you know, especially the genealogy of morals is being very active in this text as, as we, as we move, move through it. Okay, and again, the confrontation is going to be with many types, both on the left and uh, and types in the psychoanalytic uh, um, um, movements itself. So anyway, what what I'm going to do, I, I maybe is go through the order of reading and some of the things that I think are going to be important for us uh, to give us again a, a sense of uh, um, the, the book itself. Uh, Josh uh, Calbo. Josh, are you here? Uh, yeah, I'm here. Oh, good. Okay. Josh put up a very nice diagram, by the way, on the Institute for Radical Imagination website of the death drive underneath and the movement of the schiz to the schizoid poles and the body without organs. It's kind of clever. And then underneath that are the, the, uh, the order of reading. So week one, we'll talk a little bit tonight about... Uh, <laughs> Foucault's, um, you know, preface, what he was really uh, doing, and uh, Mark Seems' introduction. And I'll, I'll kind of map out where we're going to go. The first part of the book, the book is divided into four parts, the anti-Oedipus. Desiring machines, and one question we can ask, why the mechanistic language? Is this a residue of Cartesianism? You know, this, this could be, a, you know, kind of a critique, but at the same time, why do they do this? And we're going to speak about uh, desiring machines, right? And really the foundation, if you will, or the beginnings, if you will, principles of a materialist psych psychiatry, you know, which we don't have. The Frankfurt School certainly tried, right? But we never really have, have had yet a materialist psych psych uh, psychiatry. Uh, I want to mention on the left, there's a man named Lucien Sev, who was a very good friend of Althusser, who just recently passed away, who wrote a book called The Marxist Theory of Personality that is worth reading, you know, in, in this vein, where he attempted to build a, 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 a materialistic um, 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 a psychiatry. Okay, so we're going to do that in the second week, and then the third week we'll continue with Desiring Machine to talk about the whole and its parts and, and the relationship to the machine. These desiring machines that it functions, it shits, it eats, it does this, et cetera. What a mistake to call it. How the factory as the unconscious is working. What is it producing, et cetera. And you'll notice that there's a lot of economic language in this because they want to take on, um, you know, of course, the Marxist tradition. There will be much in terms of production, um, exchange value, production, consumption, and uh, distribution throughout. Okay, the second part we'll go to is psychoanalysis and familialism, the holy family, you know, uh, holy familialism, which is of obviously a play on Marx's holy family, and uh, how this is a critique, if you will, of the Freudo-Marxian synthesis that are taken up. And I want to, again, preface this by another part of uh, the background to this is, of course, Marcuse's great text of 1955, The Eros and Civilization. Yeah, on, and, uh, you know, we've been rereading as a group in uh, uh, situations, uh, uh, the, uh, the repressive tolerance essay of Marcuse, uh, you know, which is very interesting for our times today in terms of an attack on, you know, the new liberalism that we're experiencing and, uh, you know, what that means in terms of tolerating it. Vote for Joe because it's important. You know, well, look what you're getting with Joe. 
the same, the, the, the old band is getting back together, right? We're, we went back in time for the great reset of 10 years ago. And I, I, I can go on for hours about this, but I, I, won't, I won't do it tonight. <laughs> Maybe later we can look at the great reset and what, what, what's happening there. So anyway, so the fourth week we'll do, we'll, we'll do a critique of this holy familialism and the imperial Oedipus, you know, and Oedipus is imperialism. And I want to mention another reading of this text that is very important to me, and we could really talk about. It is a work of decolonization. You know, Oedipus is the imperial signifier here, right? It is a product of Western dominant thought. And in a way, Franz Fanon and the whole North African movement into psychoanalysis and uh, uh, Carla, you're still here. I'll just mention this as a great book by Edmond Ortegas called African Oedipus, in which they study uh, a lot of this. I don't know if you know it, but it's it's available only in French. But you know, uh, it's you know, learn French if you don't learn it to, to read it. It's a great great study of the African Oedipus and how Oedipus is not that relevant there. So we're going to speak about this as well, that the anti-Oedipus in another way is anti-Western imperialism and anti-Western, you know, re-territorialization of psychoanalysis for, you know, the dominant advanced countries. So I, I want to keep this in mind too, as, as, as we go forward. So we'll be talking about this, the imperial eth, uh, thing. And, and, and in this case, the, the three syntheses, how they operate, because they're not that logical in terms of the way our normal Kantian, or even for that matter, Hegelian minds operate. You know, they have three types of synthesis, the connective, the disjunctive, and then the conjunctive. And this is going to play out in the fourth and fifth week. And again, uh, I didn't mention this earlier. Another person that is very important here besides Spinoza is Wilhelm Reich. The desire for slavery, very, very important in the back. In fact, if there's a stone right on which this is built, the anti-Oedipus, it may be on Reich's material attempt towards a materialist psychiatry, you know and the Reich of the mass psychology of fascism, but also the Reich of listen little man, you know, which is not really, not really taken up so much anymore. Okay, so we're gonna talk then about, you know, um, psychic, and social, uh, psychic and social repression, you know, and, and as most of you know, Reich does not have the distinction like a Lacan out of getting kicked out of one movement, he was kicked out of both, the psychoanalytic and the, and the communist movement. He was he was excommunicated from both, right? So it's it's a very interesting character and someone in terms of and, and Richard uh, I hope will contribute to this how the death drive is being displaced here in some ways, you know, and whether that's uh, whether that's relevant or whether it's it's necessary or can we have the death drive still in our you know theoretical uh, schemas, right? to uh, enhance our understanding of, you know, who we are and where we're going and the how to change things. So, because the Reich in a way thought the death drive to be a secondary, you know, moment, not primary, right? And this was a big argument with Freud uh, and, and in case, and the beyond the pleasure principle in some ways was uh, actually a response to Reich at one level. And, and also, you know, somewhat contextualized after the first great war and, uh, you know, and, and uh, but, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll go, we'll go there, we'll get there. So we'll talk about deterritorialization and re-territorialization and territorialities in the, uh, in the, uh, in the uh, fourth week, um, you know, in fifth week uh, in the psycho, uh, psychoanalysis and familialism. So that'll be uh, the, the, the first uh, part of the readings. Um, uh, and, and as I said, Josh has put up the entire, the entire uh, um, uh, group of readings. I'm just looking to see where the rest uh, um, are here. Um, you know, then, then we'll go on to the next section, which is actually a rewriting of Marx's history. You know, it's a, it's a kind of a rewriting of, of uh, through the savages, the barbarians and civilized man. And if you look at the text, this is a very important chapter in which um, um, the, the 
the rewriting of Marx's uh, notion of history is happening, right? And, and I think in a very productive way. And I'll mention alongside of that, Kojin Karatani's book on modes of exchange as something that is doing a similar thing. If people are interested in looking at different ways of reading uh, uh, history, um, you know, alongside with Marx, but at the same time expanding it into something differently. So, um, so that'll be our, our first section. And then of course, uh, the, the latter part, the, that, that's the third section on the savages um, and the barbarians and the so-called civilized, uh, you know, and uh, we'll, we'll speak here about um, uh, um, Nietzsche's genealogy and the theater of cruelty in the sixth week. And then the seventh week will be on the founding of the Urstadt. What, what, what is the founding of the state? What does this mean in terms of territorialization, right? And how maybe the schizoid or the nomadic intensities are a way that are anti-statist, uh, you know, going forward. The eighth week, we'll talk about the capitalist machine, right, in civilized, uh, you know, this is again under the the book's third section, Savages, Barbarians, and Civilized Men. And this will be a kind of combination of Adam Smith and Freud. You know, they have this kind of interesting conjunctive synthesis going on there. And then the, the last two weeks, we'll, we'll go into what is schizoid analysis? Um, you know, what is being done here? How is it different than, you know, traditional psychoanalysis? And then what ultimately does, um, um, uh, uh, does this lead to and how does it play out to the notion of the rhizome that is crucial to uh, a thousand plateaus to mill plateau written eight years later so we'll be talking about uh, the forgetting if you will and the interesting thing I wrote a little small things uh, about this I'll, I'll see if I can share it it was in a, a, a journal that only had about five or six issues called Long Notes in the Short Century. I wrote on Guattari's uh, Three Pillars against Hegel, against as an anti-Hegelianism. And in a way, this book is, oh yeah, that, Josh has a copy of it, yeah. <laughs> anyway, good. Um, so uh, anyway, um, the, the, the attack is on the Hegelian pious destruction versus an overarching, you know, rupture or complete rupture with the Hegelian system. So we're gonna talk about that as well. You know, how maybe a new kind of synthetic ground is being created here uh, uh, in a way. So uh, that, that'll go on. So the tasks of schizoid analysis. And then I thought we would look at the rhizome, you know, uh, versus that of the tree as a thinking of language and movement from the, from the uh, thousand plateaus. So that's sort of where we're going. So like I said, we'll go over each, each section very carefully each week. You know, I, I've divided this into, um, you know, the 10 weeks. So we would do next week, Desiring Machines. And again, the, uh, the, the, uh, the schedule is on the Institute webpage and we'll see if Matt can get it out to you as well. Um, you know, and we're gonna talk about Desiring Machines uh, next week and uh, how the materialist uh, psychiatry is being formed. Uh, so anyway, uh, and as I said, we're gonna, I'm gonna create a website in which some of the definitions can be uh, put out too, um, uh, so that you don't get so lost uh, in, in this language of deterritorialization, body without organs, you know, um, <laughs> et cetera, which, you know, is, uh, you know, tell a doctor that. <laughs> you know, the body without organs, right? And uh, we'll, we'll go from there. Uh, so um, anyway, um, uh, I, I, think, I, I think there's, you know, obviously a lot of, lot of material, a lot to work with here. Um, uh, again, uh, um, uh, there's also a linguistic theory that I might want to, I want to go over as well, uh, that is anti-Saussurian. Uh, uh, anti uh, 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 Chomsky. It is not about competence, and it's not about um, uh, you know synchronic uh, um, um, uh, diachronic uh, moments. Uh, it's really about becoming, and uh, so we'll, we'll speak about that too. Language not as transformant, transparent uh, forms of communication, but something very different. In fact, they have a relationship to a kind of 
the uh, the occult as a medium here, which is kind of interesting that they go back to kind of 19th century uh, notions here of language as medium, not as a, uh, a transparency of communication or something in Chomsky's case of uh, uh, competence and uh, language systems in such so sure sense leading to a kind of petrification uh, of language into structures, right, instead of keeping it living and active and subversive. Because if you really think about this, um, you know, them listening to people like Kleist versus Hegel, you know, Artaud versus Brecht in some ways, although I love Brecht, it is Antoine Artaud that they're positioning against the theater of alienation or the estrangement effect in theater. Uh, certainly Beckett in terms of, uh, you know, M alone, Malone dies, I'll go on, I can't go on, I'll go on, the Beckett of that, uh, the Beckett of Endgame, uh, et cetera. All of these moments uh, uh, are for them, I think ways of looking at language and someone mentioned earlier, I, I think uh, uh, someone said something about Finnegan's Wake, learning to read Finn Finnegan's Wake. In a sense, this is a kind of an attempt to decode, destroy, you know, uh, uh, linguistic uh, norm normativity, if you will, linguistic structures in terms of freeing us from a kind of, you know, to use Nietzsche's phrase, the prison house of language, you know, in many ways. So that this is also operative too. And that somehow they look at psychoanalysis, and I, I know I'm being extreme here, but it's a police state uh, in some ways. So the surveillance that is operative in the psychoanalytic encounter and in the practice for them is a police state. And they use examples. I mean, I don't know, you probably don't know these names. Bella Grunberger, who did very interesting work on narcissism and Janine uh, Chateaugay Smergel, both of whom were sort of kicked out <laughs> of French psychoanalytic uh, uh, theory because of their attempts to go well beyond the dominant modes at that time, including the Lacanians. So, uh, you know, uh, uh, again, uh, uh, there's, there's a lot to, lot to chew on here, et cetera. So, um, uh, so we'll also, yeah, look at their theory of language, their theory of knowledge, you know, what, what is involved in terms of intuition. So some of the philosophical uh, um, uh, aspects will be, uh, will be taken on too. Um, um, the book, uh, by the way, Gerard Mendel, In Order to Decolonize the Child, 1971, you know, speaking of this, uh, his name is Mendel, M-E-N-D-E-L, uh, uh, Gerard uh, Mendel. It was a book that kind of created a stir, you know, when I talk about that this is a way of doing, uh, you know, therapy as a, as a decolonized moment, part of the diaspora, if you will. Fanon being very active, if you read Fanon uh, against Hegel in Black Skin, White Masks, right? If you read Fanon's, uh, you know, clinical writings, very interesting, different kind of stuff. So there's a lot of influence going on here that they don't cite directly, but it's obviously happening in these clinics at that time. And our, our one question that's very radical here is desire in its most reduction form revolutionary, right? Or is it fascist, <laughs> right? Where, where are we gonna go with this in a sense? It does desire, Ultimately, is it revolutionary? And, and they, they speak to this throughout. They think it is, this is a presupposition. So we have this, this moment here, if you will, of a kind of background of a strange mixture, if you will, of Rousseau and Nietzsche, Spinoza, Rousseau and Nietzsche always working. And uh, again, the presupposition here is it's the social, not the individual psychic, <laughs> um, you know, it is always the socius that is determining things. Very Marxist, you know, in terms of the German ideology that social relations determine our consciousness, not the way, other way around. But they use this term socius, S-O-C-I-U-S, you know, kind of bringing us together in the socio, socius uh, uh, debate. So anyway, maybe what we'll do is we'll look at Foucault's um, um, preface. I don't know if you had a chance to read that, but I think it's a very nice uh, entree into the book. Uh, they were always both very good friends. Uh, you know, as uh, most of you know, Foucault was very active in, uh, 
in uh, 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 the penal uh, reform and, uh, and, and, and wrote a, a discipline and punish somewhat and intervened on Attica. And I wanna recommend a piece uh, for those of you interested in surveillance uh, techniques and uh, uh, that Jean Jacques-Alain Millier, uh, Lacan's son-in-law wrote a brilliant piece on Jeremy Bentham's panoptic uh, optic, uh, apparatus. This is an October issue number 41. It's a very beautiful piece after Attica happened. You know, many, maybe some of you know Annette Rubinstein, who did uh, uh, work on Attica and the uprising there uh, during that period. But Millier has a, a absolutely brilliant piece on this, on the Panopticon and its use in the prison, you know, and during the Attica riot riots. So very interesting to me, this notion of psychoanalysis and using the tools, if you will, of psychoanalysis to understand the panopticon, but how it itself becomes a panopticon, the kind of irony that's happening there, the, the, the surveillance. So anyway, maybe we'll go to Foucault for a little while. Um, you know, the, the preface, I don't know, did everybody have a chance to look at it or do you have the book? We can go through it. I think it's just a, a nice little fun thing that he wrote, <laughs> you know, for his friend uh, Deleuze. Um, um, I had the pleasure of hearing, uh, uh, I never heard uh, Deleuze uh, speak and I want to go back to what uh, uh, Josefa uh, mentioned about the Italian. Mauricio Lazzarato, who I consider to have some of the best you know, synthesis of uh, psychoanalysis and uh, uh, Deleuzian uh, principles as well alongside Marx's political economy was a student of Deleuze and Deleuze attracted many of the radicals of the 68 <laughs> you know, a moment both from France and, and, and from Italy to his classes. So there was a real formation taking on, taking place in the 70s during the biker meinhof upright, you know, the, of course, the Rosso Brigado and many other groups in, in Europe uh, during this period. And uh, um, uh, so Deleuze was very, very, uh, very crucial to the formation of a group of intellectuals who have appeared on the scene. And, and I think one of the best exemplaries, as exemplars of this is Maurizio Lazzarato, uh, the uh, indebted man and a book called uh, uh, Wars and Capital. He just read with Deleuze, one of Deleuze's best students, Eric Aliez, uh, A-L-L-I-E-Z. Uh, Eric Aliez wrote a book called Capital Times. Uh, which is another kind of Deleuzean approach to what Josepha had mentioned, temporality in De Deleuze, which is, you know, obviously very influenced by Henri Bergson. And we'll, we'll go there later too. But anyway, go, going to, back to Foucault, his thing, he, he actually said what I said, you know, that everybody had to be on equal footing with Freud and Marx, but this book is a, a movement a, a, away, away from that. And he says, um, it's a mistake to read anti-Oedipus as a new theoretical reference. You know, as a much heralded new theory, et cetera. It's not a flashy Hegel, but it could be best read as an art. And I think that's one reason, one way we can read it. If we keep this notion of the, this image, if you will, of the Linder painting that is on the cover of the book or in the insert of the book, we're gonna get much more out of this in a sense as, as a kind of work of art. And, and he says art that is conveyed, and this is Foucault, of course, is erotic art, right? And the abstract notions of multiplicities. And Foucault goes through the three arts, the erotic arts, the theoretical arts, and the political arts. So all three are really operative here in, in, in his reading. So he wants to talk about the, the, the com combatants of the book, the, the agents that are taken on. And we still have plenty of these. I'm not gonna name names tonight, but you know, they're, they're, uh, they're, uh, they're uh, you know, very active among our, 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 our comrades and our, our colleagues out there. The political aesthetics, the sad militants, isn't it awful? Isn't it so corrupt? Isn't it so evil what's going down, et cetera? These kind of people, the depressives, right, et cetera. The terrorists of theory, 
you know, uh, we have the right theory, you know, et cetera, et cetera, right? Those who preserve the pure order of politics and political discourse, the bureaucrats of the revolution, great phrase, Foucault was always good at this, coming up with the right metaphors and the civil servants of truth. You know, Husserl said that the philosophers were civil servants of mankind, of humankind. But I like the way, you know, Foucault puts this, the civil servants of truth, right? Um, okay, so um, uh, I th very interesting. And then the second category, which is, I guess, a lot of the mental health professionals, et cetera, and, and others, the pure technicians of desire. And this is interesting, the technicians, not the artists of desire, the technicians of desire, the psychoanalysts and the semiologists of every sign and symptom. Oh, we understand that neurotic, that's a borderline case, you know, et cetera, et cetera. This kind of, you know, activity that can, who subjugate the muscle, multiplicity of desire, take multiplicity or the multiple, to the twofold law of structure and lack. So this is interesting too. And I mean, this is a kind of riff against Lacan at one level. And, you know, again, not totally because, uh, you know, I have a nice a copy. Uh, I mean, it's not the original, but I have a copy of the letter that Foucault and uh, uh, Lacan exchanged. They had great respect for each other in many ways, but, you know, the French are good at going for each other's throats, you know, we're too civil in North America, and in the Anglo world, you know, everything is nice, you know, I, I, uh, I uh, uh, agree to disagree here, this is the kind of working premise always, instead of, you know, going for the, the jugular and the polemics, and in fact, this may be part of our problem, we don't really have enough polemics uh, happening, the poll is not there, to use Bruno, you know, in the politics and the poll, the polemics are really inoperative in, in a sense. You want, to, you want to say something about that, Bruno? You have a, a great concept on that, on poll and politics. Uh, yeah, yeah. I mean, I don't know, um, something about poll and politics in particular, yeah. poll. Yeah. yeah, I mean, the reference that we made once was from actually in relation to Heidegger's the East, right? I mean, uh, the, right. where he says that politics is uh, the pole, basically, around which, you know, yes. Um, yeah, that, that is all for now. I mean, I, I don't know. I mean, uh, since uh, I was, uh, when you spoke about the desiring machine, about which I'm sure we'll speak more, we'll speak more next time, but. Uh, I was thinking of uh, the Hobbes also reference when, when you say the, the, the question of uh, whether desire is uh, not yeah. uh, one direction or the other, but uh, uh, Hobbes uh, before Spinoza also no, uh, uh, highlights the question of uh, uh, the human being as a, a machine of desire. He doesn't use the language, but I mean, he, he speaks of desire. And, uh, and, and of course the human body is a machine. So the human being is a, uh, a desiring, desiring machine, right? And so, and that relates to the question of the foundation of politics uh, as well uh, as the foundation of, uh, you know, I mean, in a sense, Hobbes uh, gives precisely uh, a, a recipe for why servitude uh, is uh, uh, not to um, is better in a sense than uh, than uh, freedom Free because Free of uh, the desire that. Among the various desires we had, there is also that for uh, right. for uh, um, peace and security, right? And so, I mean, so that that, that may, may be a moment risk. which yeah. huh? lack of risk. And I'm glad you right, bring right. it up so, because, in a way, our universe today is one of Hobbesian. You know, it's a Hobbesian yeah. universe. Exactly. And unless we understand this, and we speak don't speak to this, we're really missing something deeply. You know, in in many ways. The, the kind of Bacon, Baconian, Hobbesian universe that we inhabit. You know, empirical science, right? Alongside that of, as you mentioned, the drive for security, the drive for guarantee, you know, the, the, all, all of these notions that actually have, have made us less and less human and more subjected to the outside telling us what to do, right? Right, and right. Government and that, yeah. understands very well. 
Yeah, please go ahead. No, and the problem with that, which is also even a, an ontological problem in a sense, is that this is also part of desire. So this is what complicates right. Right. desire. And uh, in a sense, uh, but not only in the in relation to Deleuze and Gattari, but to the type of uh, you know situation we are living through today, maybe precisely as you said, Hobbes might be the contrastive figure number one in a sense because right. we do live in a, a Hobbesian uh, world, yeah. right? And uh, yeah, Absolutely. yeah, right. yeah, mm -hmm. right. Okay, good. Okay, yeah. So we'll we'll go on. I mean, I'm I'm just okay. trying to make again the point that we're very uh, afraid yeah, of Hugo was because of the reason. Yeah, Hugo, you wanted to say something? Yeah, go ahead and uh, mention mm -hmm. about the artificial- Not animal. any extensive comment, yeah. just yeah. wondering, yeah. you know, whether the Hobbesian artificial animal might relate to the body without organs, as we're just trying to come to terms with eventually what, what that concept is, and I'm not entirely clear myself on it just yet. Right, uh, you know, um, I, I hear you, and I, I think it's very important to keep that in mind and and i think it does influence the body without organs but i think we should get into the text before we you know basically try to explain body without organs in a sense right i mean i think it'd be more important to do that since that becomes a a complicated notion right uh going forward i mean one of the critics two criticisms have been leveled against this book i mean you know on an active basis one is of course the mechanistic language right <laughs> that it's not organic, right? That, that, and doesn't really have this organic uh, unfolding happening. This is one of the, the things. And also the other one was that it was a celebration of schizophrenia. To my mind, nothing is further from the truth. I don't see it as a celebration, but a lot of people in the analytic community read this as a celebration of the schizoid, of the schizophrenic. And there's nothing to celebrate if you know people that have suffered, you know, or have, you know, been schizophrenic or still are, you know, we, we know this, we know how it's treated in the culture. I don't think this is the intention at all here. So, but I, yeah, we'll go back to that. And, and you bring up a great, great point about the art of artificial animal. And I think that's there too. You know, the French have a very good way of coding, you know, and undercoding their thought without going directly into a problematic, uh, you know, and saying, you know, we're, we're encountering Hobbes here right? Or, or we're using ops and, you know, in a sense, so, but that it's hidden in the text. So you bring up a really good, good point. But let me, let me go back to Foucault just so, so we can go. And then he says, last but not least, so we have the types and then this, this notion of multiplicity against structure and uh, structure and lack. And again, I was just trying to make a point that this fear of polemics is part of our culture right now. We're really afraid of the polemics, you know, uh, uh, you know, in, in many, many areas. We, we disagree, we tweet, we do these things, but the real polemics, the real hardcore stuff is not really happening that much. You know, it's all about, you know, yeah, yeah, isn't it great kumbaya, kumbaya, you know, kind of mentalities for so many people at this point. So we'll, we'll, we'll go back to that. But third, finally, the strategic uh, enemy is fascism, right? And not only historical fascism, which I think Foucault is very, uh, uh, knows very much about, the fascism of that is Hitler and Mussolini, which was able to mobilize and use the desire of the masters effectively, but also the fascism in all of us. So again, this, this Reichian notion, the fascism that cause, causes us to love power, to desire the very thing that dominates and exploits us. Again, a question mark, but a kind of an interesting point by Foucault. You know, is this book really, uh, again, uh, a handbook, if you will, to rid us of the fascist traces or this desire for power? And I really ask the question, what is power lowercase versus uppercase? As Negre very well does in his Spinoza book, uh, you know, the savage anatomy, you know, it's a very interesting moment. And I, I want to say this about uh, Tony Negre, uh, again, a relationship going back to the to Deleuze. Deleuze was instrumental in getting Negre into France. And uh, Guattari also was totally instrumental. Um, and Josh has a copy of that long news. We got Negre to write a homage for, Neg uh, for Felix after his death in that, that edition as well as a piece by Guattari on what is God, 
<laughs> so it's kind of interesting too, because God is God is described as the master of the disjunctive uh, syllogism, and God is also described as double articulation or the two pincers of the of the of the uh, cr of the crawfish, right? Which is interesting too. <laughs> You know, so uh, anyway, the, this whole notion of fascism and power is very important. Another thing that we, uh, you know, don't really talk about in terms of not only our own empowerment, but the power in us and how we, you know, are all too ready once again to hierarchize, you know, the verticality that is involved here, you know, uh, how sometimes even pure horizontalism in, in social movements is filled with power. You know, that's the first thing one should be aware of is that horizontalism in terms of its claims sometimes is filled with power. Carl, did you want to say something? Yeah, please. Yeah. Oh, yeah. no, no. I was just I was just agreeing, <laughs> just agreeing with. You. OK, OK. Uh, so anyway. All right. So anyway, um, uh, then Foucault makes the claim that I, I mean, I, I really believe this, a book of ethics, uh, you know, he says, how does one keep from being fascist? I mean, for me, the ethics question, once again, is this question that uh, Bruno, myself and others, Hugo, have now positioned. Why do we desire our slavery rather than our freedom? What, what sets up this kind of servitude in us is really the, the question I think that is posed here and is looking at you know, through an, uh, you know, the schizoid and now analytical framework, as well as a historical moment here in this way. And, and, and what is, what does really mean to be a revolutionary militant as well? As ma many of us have been around for a long time, almost in every movement, you see this in the Panthers, you see this in many organizations, this hierarchization, this notion, this use of power at a certain stage, uh, you know, how we would be, you know, engaged in, in undoing that in future movements and what would that do for us, right? Yeah, yeah, okay. So yeah, I'll go through the notion of machine through the book too. Yeah, I'll try my best to, you know, bring that up. Uh, you know, the, the French language uses machinaic as well too, you know, so I'll, I'll, I'll speak to that next week when we go into desiring machines, it's a, it's a good question. So then Foucault ends here um, about uh, the, the fascist traces in the body, which again is a Reichian notion, character analysis being the fundamental. Have most people read Wilhelm Reich or certainly aware of him, right? Uh, the mass, mass, yeah, yeah. Major work, I mean, you know, in terms of the history of, you know, again, not well liked by many schools of psychoanalysis because there isn't the emphasis on language, you know, and the body. The body is where everything is. Listening to the body is the Reichian, Reichian moment. And you can trace everything there. And as you know, uh, Franz Fanon once said, only in America could they destroy a mind of such quality. You know, uh, Reich was put in jail in Leavenworth, Kansas, uh, you know, for mail order uh, sales of the organ accumulator. Uh, so uh, anyway, uh, yeah. Uh, yeah, and anyway, the cancer biopathy biopathy uh, is very very interesting to read too in terms of the of the uh, thing. I'm not saying I agree completely with Reich, but very interesting figure, and again, crucial to this book is Reich. You know, you know, on the on the structural level and the psychoanalytic uh, traditional level, Reich, Lacan, and Freud are crucial, right? Are crucial as well as some other findings such as Ortegas, et cetera, um, um, uh, uh, as, as, as we um, you know, engage this more. Okay, so um, then he goes through his um, uh, Foucault, and this is kind of interesting. Look, this is dated. This is you know, when most of us are you know, still, I mean, some of us in this room, real spring chickens, so to speak, uh, goes back a long time, uh, back in the free political action from all unitary and totalizing paranoia. Now, I think that's still, you know, interesting, you know, in a sense, you don't want to, you know, uh, uh, get into a unitary totalizing paranoia and uh, engage at that level. And then to develop action thought and desires instead of by unitary signifiers or principles in the Aristotelian sense, do it by proliferation, ju juxtaposition and disjunction. And I think this is where a filmmaker like Godard is very impressive. 
And on another level, Chantelle Ackerman, you know, uh, if, if you know her work too, a kind of post Godardian uh, artist. You know, Godard, of course, is always working through juxtaposition, proliferation, right? <laughs> right? There's nothing, there's no beginning, middle, and end to the film, you know, et cetera. Very much against the classic Aristotelian notions or there's the standard narrative in, in film, et cetera. So he's always doing this and 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 he and it's very little pyramidical hierarchization, actually, because of course we're referring to organizations here. So this is interesting too. Withdraw allegiance from the old categories of the negative, uh, uh, negative, the law, the limit, the ca castration, you know, the bedrock of psychoanalysis to some, right? Lack. Lacuna, right, which Western thought is held, held sacred as a form of power and an access to reality. Prefer what is positive and multiple, right? Difference over uniformity, flows over unities, mobile arrangements over systems. And they're going to go this way throughout these mobile arrangements, which I think speaks to the current generation in a different way. You know, it spoke to us in, in a certain way, but now uh, going back to, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, Beryl and her, her son, right, <laughs> that, that this mobile arrangements is very interesting in a way, this kind of multiplicity that's playing out and whether or not this can speak to it. So then, and, and, and product, production is not sedentary. And this is obviously Nietzsche, those of you that have read the critique of educational institutions by Nietzsche, especially Schopenhauer as educator, uh, you know, what the artist hates the most is the sedentary, the status quo, the desire for the status quo. This, this is a real visceral hatred. This is what Nietzsche and Marx, despite very different political um, you know, affinities, ultimately, they had in common. They could not stand the sedentariness of the middle class or the complacency and the maintenance of the status quo. This is very, very important to remember. You know, uh, This does not stop that your revolution has an, a limit. Always a process, ongoing, lifelong. You know, or as Peter Bratzis, our friend, likes to say about when the revolution happens, we will not have, um, um, you know, um, um, you know, uh, camps, or we're going to have lifetime learning camps. You know, <laughs> with all process going forward. <laughs> People were, you know, again miseducated, so to speak. Okay, so do not think that one has to be in order to be a militant, even though the one is fighting is ab ab uh, abominable. It is the connections of desire to reality and not its retreat for, into the forms of representation that possess the re re revolutionary force. And this is interesting too, uh, you know, in terms of avant-garde art and, you know, the destructive um, uh, moments of that destructive as a positive category. Uh, do not use thought to ground a political practice in truth and Foucault capitalizes truth uh, again, a real problem with philosophy, this ongoing search for, quote, the truth. I think one of the reasons that a Heidegger, a Lithia, right, um, you know, certainly Deleuze in terms of uh, multiplicity and, and the nomad and, 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 and Nietzsche in, in a different way that there is no, quote, ultimate truth, right? are all very active today in, in people's thinking, you know, uh, um, in, in, uh, both in the left and in, you know, people that are of uh, more creative lines of force. Okay, so um, do not uh, use thought to grand, ground a, a political practice in truth, nor political action to discredit, as mere speculation, a line of thought, right? So to follow that line of thought and use political practice as an intensifier of thought and an analysis as a multiplier of the forms and domains for the intervention of political action. You can begin to see Foucault's, you know, kind of, um, um, you know, anti, you know, of course, Stalinism playing here, playing out here, as well as other, you know, uh, things where he goes later in terms of governmentality. And do not demand of politics, and I think this is crucial for our time, because this is the liberal tolerance, and this is a kind of play on Marcuse's great essay of repress on repressive tolerance, that it restore the rights of the individual 
right? This whole drive towards rights and the and the human rights as philosophy has defined them. The individual is the product of power. What is needed, and this is something Bruno is doing in his work on singularities and the individual, is to de-individualize by means of multiplication, displacement, and diverse combinations. The group would not be the organic bound uniting hierarchies individuals, but a constant generator of de-individualization. And this is something that Guattari took up very actively in his militant practice. I want to say this about Guattari. He did not like the money nexus in psychoanalysis. He thought there was a tremendous power relationship there. I'm not so sure I agree with this because probably people wouldn't go <laughs> to therapy or participate if they didn't have a stake, an economic stake that way. But he did speak of something that's interesting, economically speaking, that sometimes psychoanalysis became involved in the rotation of family capital. It was a kind of protectionist moment. And we'll go through this when we go to Adam Smith and Freud later, that it was a rotation of family capital in terms of the couch and the scene. And this whole thing that I, I mentioned on a little course description that the, 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 the goal of psychoanalysis, the family has made you sick and neurotic, you know, et cetera, and sad, et cetera. The new family, you know, i.e. Freud who can play all the roles in your family, theatrically, et cetera, will make you well, right? They're very much against that kind of recoding. You know, I want, I want us to be aware of this, that this exercise is much more about constantly decoding and constantly going beyond the attempt to recode. You know, and in a way, Nietzsche becomes crucial for this as the nomadic thinker who is able to, in some ways, stop all the codes, right? in terms of structure lack, in terms of diachronic and synchrony, right? In terms of linguistic competence, all of these things are working out, you know, in, 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 in Deleuze and uh, Guattari's, uh, you know, streams of consciousness coming together into this third, you know, uh, uh, river, if you will. Uh, so very, very interesting in that, in that regard. So again, um, you know, this notion of the liberal notion of rights you know, they're so prevalent, prevalent, you know, I mean, most of us may listen to a uh, democracy now. I mean, three out of every five thing, if, uh, say, uh, things are either, if it's not Chomsky or some other person, uh, VJ Prashad or whatever, Cornell West, it's about human rights. <laughs> this is what uh, Amy does, right? It's really about human rights and, and, and uh, what's happening. For Deleuze and Gauthier, that's a very misplaced notion in terms of power and power relations. I know it has practical concrete things. We don't want children held in isolation at the border. We don't, we can see what the policies are, but to them there's there's more at stake here, right? The constant generation of de-individualization and de-individualization and uh, do not become finally enamored of power. And um, um, so uh, anyway, I think also he says something very important and something we've forgotten too. And you know, we wrote about this, uh, Josh Bruno and I that are here today uh, in the pandemic paper number one, which as Bruno aptly uh, described it as a unreadable but uh, highly uh, provocative text. Uh, <laughs> uh, we wrote on, uh, you know, what one aspect is we need more cheerful nihilism, you know, in a way. We need more cheer you know, less, less depression, et cetera. So they actually say the traps of anti are that of humor. And this is something, again, we lack very much of on the left, you know, the comic, you know, in, in, in a certain way. And, uh, you know, in a way, of course, the Beckett of the tragic comic, you know, uh, as well right, in terms of the artworks, et cetera. You know, uh, I was, I, I, I knew uh, the novelist Walker Percy in New Orleans who wrote the famous book, The Movie Goer. And, uh, you know, he told me the sign of a good book is after you read it, you feel healthy. You know, you're able to laugh and you really feel healthy. It's really giving you a good feeling. So this is, this is kind of interesting to me. You know, in a way, if I read Beyond Good and Evil, I feel better, you know, after reading Nietzsche. 
in some ways. I mean, you know, it's a book towards the great health. And that's something we have to think about too, I think on the left, that this book may be one step along that way. One of the, you know, fundamental, what I mean, a prolemma gamma for a future philosophy. So this is Foucault's, you know, gesture, if you will, to the introduction to the non-fascist life as an introduction to his uh, friend Gilles Deleuze and, and uh, Felix Guattari. So then the introduction is interesting from Mark Seem, who was one of the trans, uh, translator of which um, uh, he mentions uh, Lang in terms of ego lost, uh, you know, um, um, uh, this is on page uh, 17. I want to just point out a couple of other things because I think Seem uh, hits, hits it on the head. Much like R.D. Lang, Deleuze and Guattari aim to develop a materialistically and experientially based analysis of the breakdown and the breakthrough. Both breakdown and breakthrough that characterize some of those labeled schizophrenic by psychiatry. Rather than view the creations and productions of desire, all of desiring production from the point of view of the norm and the normal. And again, I mentioned another text. I'm sorry, I have this associative type of mind. Uh, uh, Georges Conquillon's The Normal and the Pathological is a must read of how the pathological came to be known as the pathological, a teacher of both Foucault's and Deleuze's, by the way. They, they force their analysis into the sphere of extremes. And this is very important to me. From paranoia to schizophrenia, from fascism to revolution, from breakdowns to breakthroughs, what is investigated is the process of life flows as they oscillate from one extreme to the other on a scale of intensity that goes from zero. And they quote, I never asked to be born, please leave me in peace, right? And then to the body without organs, which we'll go back to the nth power. I am all that exists, all the names in history, which is, as most of you know, a quote from Nietzsche. I am all the names in history. Exe homo uh, of Nietzsche, behold, behold the man. Yeah. Uh, and the schizophrenic process of desire. So this, this is, again, important to know that this is both a, a work of diagnostics, right, on a clinical level, as well as uh, I think on the social level, of course, and also a work, if you will, I hope of healing, or at least some parameters for our own healing during this uh, pandemic uh, period, okay? Then he goes on to the experience of delirium, uh, you know, and, and ego loss, which, uh, you know, Lang asked for, um, you know, many times. And, uh, you know, uh, Lang, by the way, uh, the book, um, uh, the Critique of Dialectical Reason wrote a book, uh, a, a book called Reason and Violence on Sartre, and Sartre said he was the only one that understood the, the, the critique of dialectic reason. So Lang was a, a real, real figure, someone totally forgotten today, the divided self, self and others, the Scottish, you know, psychiatrist who ended up at uh, Tavistock um, Clinic. Uh, very, very important to, you know, return. Lang was very, very important uh, during this period. Uh, again, the, 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 the profession itself, the, 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 the dominant, uh, you know, uh, dominance in the profession was against Lang and against people like Duas, Deleuze and Guattari because they were dangerous to the normative you know, set of circumstances that were being created. I understand the limits and we can talk about that too. And since we have people who are here have been, uh, you know, who are psychoanalysts and actually involved in practices, whether or not this is something that is so desirable, <laughs> right? Given where we are, but, and what, what its limits may be. And if it is something that is useful, you know, uh, to, to practice and uh, to healing. You know, to my mind, I think they, they have it right. Imagine a schizophrenic on a stroll versus the neurotic on the couch. And that the open air has a much more interesting kind of paradigm to work with, right? In a sense, right? To really think it through that way. And we'll talk more about that and where they're coming from on that, on that moment. Okay, so Paige, uh, I'm just pointing out a few of the highlights, a very good introduction by uh, Seam, by the way. Um, unlike uh, Nietzsche's anti-nihilist, Duelus and Guattari's anti epist not alone. It's not the ubermensch and it's not a transcendent category. 
uh, Deleuze and Guattari call for actions and passions of a collective nature in the here and now. And then madness is divined, and this is interesting as a definition of madness, as a radical break from power in the form of a disconnection. Going back to the boy uh, with a machine, he disconnects from the family neurosis. I don't need daddy, mommy, me triangulation anymore. I'm going to plug into something different, right, in some way. So we'll, we'll again speak to that. So militancy in their framework would learn from madness, but also move beyond it, beyond disconnections and deterritorialization to new connections. And a politics of desire would see loneliness and depression as the first things to go. And we're really witnessing that right now. I mean, I've been reading a lot about the COVID, you know, effect, COVID fatigue, you know, uh, experiencing, you know, uh, through discussions with a lot of people, what's happening to relationships, et cetera. So uh, this is something we could really talk about too. How do we overcome this kind of prevalence? And again, you can think about depression with the dollar signs, right? The two S's, you know, if you want to do a Godard film, just bar the, the S's, depression, repression, you know, <laughs> compression, all of these, these notions, uh, you know, with, uh, you know, what it really means to capitalism. So the anti-edible um, strategy, if man is connected to the machines of the universe, going back to Hugo and this body, body without organs, he is in tune, if he is in tune with his desires, if he is anchored. And the body without organs starts with the figure of the egg, by the way. I'll go through this next week. I don't want to, you know, go, go so far ahead, but it begins with the figure of the egg, right? Uh, he seizes the word about the fitness of things and about the behavior, about right or wrong, justice, and if the roots are in the current, he will float on the surface and, you know, give fruit like a lotus, et cetera. The process is everything. So we'll, we'll talk about that uh, more and more. Um, so revolutionaries, artists, and seers are content to be objective, merely objective. They know the desire, um, um, class life and its powerly productive embrace and reproduces it in a way that all the more intense because it has few needs. And never mind that I believe that this is very easy to say just in books. So really in a way, the revolutionary militant is always alongside the artists of the avant-garde and those who are far seen, always objective, but merely objective, right? They're seen well beyond the immediate subjective needs through lack and structure into you know, a real kind of practice of the how. So these are, these are the ways that, uh, you know, both Foucault as a celebration in the preface and Mark Seem introducing uh, the, the book um, um, uh, brings us to. So next time, I mean, I want to go through Desiring Machines. This begins, at least in my edition. I don't know, does anyone, they have the other edition? I see you have a Rutledge edition there, um, Dom. Uh, you have the Penguin. Some people have the Minnesota. Okay, I hope the pages are the same, but we're going to begin Desiring Production, the Desiring Machines, which is the first, um, the first um, chapter, right? And, um, and, um, of this um, of this section, and this is the section uh, desiring production, and the first motion is of that of the machine of the desiring machine, right? And um, um, I want to point out a several things um, that if you look at this, the crucial passages in terms of principles are on page three, um, the process of production, right? Everything is production, page four, and page five, four and five, uh, the distinction between men and nature. So we're going to really talk about this. Uh, there's no distinction between man and nature. That what a mistake to call the phenomenological germ man and world. They are eliminating the conjunction. Okay? The elimination is of man and world. Right? It's just world. <laughs> Right. So this is very interesting. In a way, this is a very anti-humanist text. This is, again, uh, to go back, uh, you know, to what we talked about earlier in the Frankfurt School with Eric Fromm in particular, um, you know, against this kind of humanistic reading 
of the psychoanalytic and the Marxist tradition. You know, so this is a very anti-humanist uh, uh, text in that way, right? And uh, then they'll go. Then they'll go on to the founding of a materialist psych psychiatry. Now, uh, Matt, are you here? You're here, right? We can get a, a web. We can get a web page up, right? Is that? Yeah. Is he still here? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. I was just wondering. We can get a web page up so I can maybe do some uh, some of the definitions yeah. because the the thing next week will be the. Uh, the question of uh, social desire, right? Um, you know, uh, uh, what is desiring production? I want to put this up, you know, before next week, but people can read along with because we're going to get a we're going to get a good background here, grounding, if you will, of the of the notion. What is schizoid analysis? Uh, how do you subsume? Uh, again, I want to say that Marx and Freud are subsumed into a Nietzschean framework. I want to I want to point that out. This is going on in the book. This is the Hegelian move, even though they're anti-Hegelian. There's a subsumption of both Marx and Freud, you know, Lacan, Freud, and and Althusser, if you will, into into uh, you know a Nietzschean perspective, right? Into a Nietzschean moment, right here. So uh, this this is interesting. And uh, uh, the desire is social, and that the, the, the best guide to social um, desire is the schizophrenic rather than the neurotic on the couch or the neurotic ego. So the best guide to learning what desire is socially as the socius is really the schizophrenic on the stroll. He'll use the, the, they'll use the example of this with Lentz, right? And... Um, um, and this this will be juxtaposed, if you will, to the neurotic ego, right? In a sense, right? Okay. So um, this is this, this schizoid. Again, I want to emphasize is not a celebration of the schizoid on the stroll or of schizophrenia. It's not a glorification nor a celebration, but it is to act as a guide to explore the contemporary society itself in many ways, right? And backgrounding this again, I will mention uh, there, there are two crucial texts in this in terms of double bind hypothesis. Number one is Gregory Bateson, uh, Steps to an Ecology of Mind. Yeah, worth reading, you know, of course, uh, Margaret Mead's husband, <laughs> maybe we can frame him that way. <laughs> from from this this point on, Bateson was a major social thinker and part of the construction of the social sciences in the United States. The Palo Alto School that studies the double bind, you know, at Stanford for many years. And the other one is Michael Schneider's Neurosis and Class Structure, translated as Neurosis and Civilization, in which there's some very interesting uh, sections, and I'll I'll find the reference for you. Um, um, I'm going to have to do a little digging because I think the book is in uh, Montreal, not here with me, but I'll, I'll find it on the double messaging of the mother early on that produces these kind of codes that, you know, contribute to the, the schizoid. So we'll talk about that as a background as well, um, too. So um, um, I want to I want to um, also uh, mention that we're we're We'll, we'll look at the first um, uh, 35 pages. I don't think it's that, that much of a, a read. There's a lot of density here, but 35 pages should be pretty good per week, right? 30 to 35 pages. And once we get into it, hopefully we'll get, get better. I mean, you'll find some real humor here, page 13 on, of course, we believe in God, the response to Judge Daniel Paul Schraber. And uh, we'll speak about that as one of the case studies of Freud. Um, to Schraber's, by the way, father was the headmaster of the school where Nietzsche went to school as a, as a child. So this is a very interesting moment, um, um, you know, um, 
uh, too. Um, and then our toe is very interesting, the use of our toe in terms of breaking up Oedipal um, triangulation. If, if my references are too much, please stop me and I'll explain who Antoine Artaud is. His famous movie role was in Carl Theodore Dreyer, uh, Richard knows this, uh, uh, son, uh, Joan of Arc. <laughs> you know, Artaud played one of the judges <laughs> in, that, in that great film, Masterpiece, by the way, uh, you know, in the history of cinema. Anyway, uh, a lot of you know Guattari, not as much as the Deleuze, was an incredible film of Ficciano and wrote two books, Movement uh, Time and Movement Image um, uh, on, on cinema. Uh, uh, it's a very, very interesting read. It's based on Henri Bergson's notions of simultaneity and thesis is on movement. Uh, but if you're interested in cinema, yes, of course, Deleuze is very, very interested there. And, you know, his, his work, uh, one thing Jean-Paul Sartre opened up for France, you know, like him or not, you know, and, domin and obviously he was the father. There was an Oedipal struggle, you know, in some ways, for Sartre as being the post-World War II father of intellectual life there. But what, one thing about Sartre that was really interesting uh, in terms of French thought is he opened up a way of writing for philosophy that never really took a lot, took over in the States. He was able to use literature, poetry, theater, et cetera. He obviously was an artist himself. He could write and illustrate philosophical ideas. Maybe not always, you know, in a, the best way, but at least he opened up that space for a generation that was Deleuze's, uh, you know, and uh, certainly Foucault, et cetera. So this is basically, we're reading in, in a lot of ways, the post World War II generation, not the generation of the resistance, but the generation of, you know, uh, the Marshall Plan and the anti-US stuff, uh, you know, in terms of Gilles Deleuze, right? And who, uh, you know, unfortunately, um, you know, was suffered from uh, having no lungs and, you know, just couldn't take it anymore. And Guattari, who, who died very early too. Guattari used to give lectures, by the way, at, at Cooper Union. Yeah, on echo architecture. And I'll go there too for the people that are interested in the cartography. He has a lot to say about that in his later life, you know, the, uh, the ecology that he went through uh, at the end and uh, worked with Arnie Noss, the, uh, the uh, Scandinavian uh, ecologist. Uh, so there's a lot that happened here in between. And I just finished uh, re-looking it. I don't know if you guys know this, but um, uh, Eloy left uh, but, um, and Anthony, but uh, there was a, a bank robber named uh, Jacques Mezrin. And I think I mentioned him to you. There's a two-part movie, uh, uh, Marine uh, uh, Killer Instinct. And the second thing is called Public Enemy Number One. And Mezrin was someone who funded a lot of the radical movements. And his children were in uh, Gerard Lebovici's, you know, Guy Debord's best friend who was, uh, you know, killed in 1984. So this, this the whole movement of France in the 70s is very interesting, you know, and the role of Guattari to get Negre into the country. There were many, many little subtexts and subplots around this. So this is not child stuff or just a fun book. <laughs> there are real stakes involved uh, historically. And I, I like the, the, the fact that hopefully we can read this as a, you know, a document, not only of history, but something again, that we can do as the archeology span of the present to, to use a, fr a frame of uh, Foucault's, you know, to read the present as history by rereading something of, you know, close to now, uh, I think, what is it, 50 years now, a half a century since this was done. Yeah, although I still think very relevant, you know, in, in terms of the question of desire. Yeah, and also decoding and the importance again of Nietzsche, you know, even though Nietzsche was not a leftist, farthest from, from, from it, right, in a way, but the importance of Nietzsche in terms of energy, energy flows, critique, and you know, really being a, a great symptomatologist of our times. And we can talk much more about this in terms of the movement from Hobbes to Nietzsche too. 
you know that this is important as well and the and the Nietzsche Rousseau because uh, in a way uh, this book has a lot of you know for those of you interested in philosophy a lot of the uh, Rousseauist tendencies you know man is born free but everywhere he's in chains right and the formation of social contracts although they're not interested in contracts here or contract theory so anyway, any comments, any thoughts, or anything you'd like to see uh, happening? Questions uh, before we uh, close up? I mean, I, I can go late, as p some people know here, but you know, we'll uh, we'll try to keep it limited, uh, you know, as as, as much as uh, possible. Yeah, yeah. Anybody? Any thoughts? Uh, yeah, yeah. Okay. All right. So, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Please, Carl. Yeah, I'm sorry. I'd be interested in also just hearing as we go forward. Yes. How um, the relationship to Althusser and you know that moment within the sure. Marxist tradition and and how they're in dialogue because it seems like the, that's kind of I, I would just be very interested in. in I will point that out as well as the relationship to Sartre because they have some interesting things to say about the critique of dialectical reason as well, mm -hmm. especially on groups in fusion, right, and the practico inert which I think we're really suffering from today. Yeah, so anyway, uh, good. Yeah, no, I'll, I'll bring that, I'll certainly bring that in very much, much so. Yeah, yeah, okay. A anybody else? And I mean, thank you, uh, it, it's a great group I can see and hopefully we'll have fun with this and, and it'll be, uh, you know, something uh, different. Uh, again, for me, this is a crucial text in terms of what I would phrase a prolema gamma to a principle for a philosophy of the future, you know, where a thousand plateaus is uh, operative. And I, I'm reading this alongside of both Spinoza and Nietzsche in that vein, you know, a kind of synthetic moment between those two philosophers, both force and will, if you will, kind of us and uh, will to power and that, that relation. So the political uh, of Nietzsche as well. So uh, we'll talk more about this. This is, of course, speculation on my part. Yeah, yeah. Anybody else? Uh, yeah. Okay. All right. It was, well, it was great, you. really. Thank you, Michael. Okay. Very okay. Yeah. Thank you, Michael. Very great. Yeah. Situated, and I'll do do yeah, it yeah. As, as we go forward. There's a lot of density. Thank, Thank you. you so much. Okay. Okay. Good to see everybody. Bye. Okay. Take Bye. care and have a good, safe week. Okay. Talk to you soon. Thank you. Bye.